take a look at this question right here. It's problem one from the old exam problems, and it covers things like stress, material deformation, and Poisson's ratio, so a couple different units. We're told that we have a 40 pound lamp suspended by cables AB and BC, each having an initial length of five feet. So we can see that this whole system here is symmetrical. We're told that cable AB is made of aluminum, and we're given the material properties, Young's modulus, and Poisson's ratio for that. And we're told that cable AC is made of steel, which is this cable right here. And again, we're given Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. We're told the initial diameters for AB and AC are 0.1 and 0.05 inches, respectively. The questions here ask us to calculate the normal stress in cable AB and AC, to determine the change in lengths of AB and AC, and to find the changes in diameter of AB and AC. What we can see this is all going to relate to is that stress is force over area. So the first step that we're going to need to do is draw a free better diagram of this system and solve for the forces in cables AB and B, uh, AC. Once we figure that out, we'll be able to calculate all of these different things right here. So let me get started with the free body diagram. So, as I was explaining, the first step in this problem is to draw a free body diagram. So we've got cable AB and cable AC both pointing upwards, and we've got the weight of the lamp pointing down. Now, the first thing that we really need to figure out is what is the angle of both of these cables? And because our system is symmetrical, we know that the angle of AB and the angle of AC will both be the same. So if we look up here, we can see that the total width between the two cables is 8 feet, which, given that this system is symmetrical, we know that the distance on the left is 4 feet, and the distance on the right will also be 4 feet. What this tells us is that we've got 4 down here, 5 is the hypotenuse, so if we do some thinking, we'll recognize this as a 3-4-5 triangle, and that's going to be the case for both AB and AC. Now that we know the geometries of both of the cables, we can do some of the forces in the X and some of the forces in the Y to calculate the forces in both of the cables. And I'll do that right now. Once we write out some of the forces in the X, we can see that we have negative 4 fifths AB plus 4 fifths AC. So we've got the X component of AB going to the left, the X component of AC going to the right, and we can see that because they're multiplied by the same factor, those two values are going to have to be the same. What we can then do is write our sum of the forces in the y. We'll set this equation equal to zero. So we've got 3 fifths AB plus 3 fifths AC minus the weight of the lamp going down of 40 pounds. So plugging this in down here for AB or AC, it doesn't really matter. What we're going to find is we've got 6 fifths AB is equal to 40. And as a result, with a little bit of math, we find that AB equals AC, both equal 33.3 .3 repeating pounds. So we can just double check our answer, like thinking if this makes sense. Our lamp is 40 pounds, so the fact that our tension is roughly the same order of magnitude, 33, makes some sense, and it doesn't seem too low or too high to be crazy. Like if we got the tension in each cable was one pound, that would not make any sense. If we got that the tension in both cables was 200 pounds, that should also make us a little bit confused as to whether or not our answer is right. So now that we think that our answer is pretty good, we'll move on to part A, which asks us to calculate the stress in each cable, both A, B, and A, C. So I'll write that up on the board now. So to calculate the stress in each cable, we know that we're going to use the equation for stress, which is force over area. We know the amount of force in each cable is 33.3 .3 pounds. We now just have to factor in the area. Now I've got the equations for stress of AB and stress of AC both written out. We've got the tension in each cable, 33.3 .3 pounds, divided by the area. And I'm using the equation of pi over 4 times diameter squared to get us the answer. So for cable AB and cable AC, we now know the stress by just completing these calculations here. So with a bit of math, you can see that the stress in cable AB is 4,239 PSI, and the stress in cable AC is 16,959 PSI. Now what we'll do is we'll move on to part B, which asks us for the change in length of each cable. So to calculate the change in length for each cable, we're going to use the equation change in length is equal to FL over EA. This equation here comes from the rearrangement of the Young's Modulus equation. 
So if we look, we know the force in each cable. We know the initial length, 5 feet for both cables. We'll probably need to convert that to inches. We know the Young's modulus for both cables. It's given to us in the problem statement. And we also know the cross-sectional area for both of our cables. So what I'll do now is I'll write out the equations for both of these, AB and AC, and we'll see what we get. So I've written the equation out for a change in length AB. We've got 33.3 pounds times 5 feet times 12 inches per foot, that way we have everything in inches, divided by 10 times 10 to the 6th PSI times pi over 4 times 0 0.1, the diameter of that cable, squared. And what we're going to find is that we can calculate the change in length of AB. What we find is that the change in length of cable AB is 0 0.0254 inches. Now we can repeat the process for cable AC. But before we do, I want to point one thing out to you that's a little interesting or could help you solve these problems faster in the future. If you look at the change in length equation, you've got FL over EA. F over A, we already know, is stress. And if you look, that's what we just calculated in part A. So rather than you know plugging in 33.3 pounds over the area like we just did right here, what you could do is you could actually just plug in the stress that you had in the first part. So another way to write this equation here is that the change in length is actually equal to stress times L over E. That's another like, quick way that you can do these problems. So I'll set it up with this equation for cable AC and we'll solve for the change in length. So by setting the equation up that way, what you can see I did was I took the stress of cable AC, 16,959 PSI, and I multiplied that by 60 inches, which is the length of the rope or the cable in uh, inches, divided by the Young's modulus, 30 times 10 to the sixth. When we do that, we get that the total change in length of cable AC is 0 0.0339 inches. So when we compare the two change in lengths, the change in length of AC versus the change in length of AB, we see that the change in length of AC is greater than that of AB. What that'll mean in the physical system is that the system will move down and to the left. So that's the answer to part B, is we know the deformation in both cables and we know that the system will move down and to the left. Now we're going to compute the change in diameter of both of the cables. And the way that we're going to do that is with a little piece of information we were given at the beginning, which was Poisson's ratio, the little V-looking shape. So let me write down the definition of Poisson's ratio, and then we'll solve the rest of the problem. For Poisson's ratio, we know that it's the transverse strain over the axial strain. And we know that Poisson's ratio is technically a negative. So what this tells us is that we... To solve for change in diameter, all we have to do is use the Poisson's ratio we were given, the initial diameter, which we were given for both cables, and the change in length, which that's what we just calculated, and the initial length, which is what we already knew. So it's fairly easy for us to set up this equation for both of the cables, and I'll write that on the board right now. So I plugged in all the values into our equation for Poisson's ratio for diameter of AB, and what we can see is we've got the change in diameter of AB over 0.1, divided by the change in length over the initial length, we'll get that the change in diameter of AB is going to be 1.41 times 10 to the negative 5 inches. And it's important to realize that because both of our cables are in tension, this value here will be negative. And plugging in pretty much the similar numbers for cable AC into this exact same equation, you'll see that on the solutions that I post, you'll get that the change in diameter of AC is negative 8.475 times 10 to the negative 6 inches. And that's it. There you go. That's how you did this old exam problem. Let's take a look at this step drop problem right here, which is problem number four from the old exam problems. What we're told is we've got two cylindrical sections, AB, which is made of steel, and we're given all the specs of that, and BCD, which is made of aluminum, and we're given the specifications of that. What we can see is we've got a 15 kip load applied to the top section, two 4 kip loads applied right at the junction, and two 8 kip loads applied right at this thin plate. We're asked, with the loads applied as shown, we're told that the magnitude of change in diameter of section CD is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 4 inches. And we're told to neglect and ignore the thickness of this collar 
as, law, as well as its weight in our analysis. Questions that were asked are A, B, and C. Determine the normal stress in sections A, B, B, C, and C, D. Determine the total change in length of A, B, C, D. And we're asked to determine if it increases, it stretches, or if it decreases, whoo, it gets smaller. So we'll have to figure that out. And question C is determine the Poisson's ratio for aluminum for section B, C, D. So what we'll do now is we will look at all of these three questions here. And what we can realize is that question A, when it's asking for stress, is going to involve force over area. So what we need to first figure out is the force, tension or compression, in each one of these three sections. So what we need to do is make a section cut through each section A, B, B, C, N, C, D. And I'll do that right now. So I've got my handy dandy red pen here and I've drawn a section cut through A, B, B, C, and C, D. And I've included arrows that face up because in my problem, I'm going to consider each of these section cuts to be looking up. The reason I do that is so that we don't look and include the fixed support down here at the bottom. The reason is, is that technically speaking, this would have three reactions. It would have some of the, it would have a force on the Y, it would have an X force, and it could have a reaction moment. So I don't want to have to solve for any of that stuff. I want to just look up and see only the forces that are applied, and that'll make my life a lot easier. So what I'll do now is with these three section cuts, right here in this bottom section of my paper, I'll draw the free body diagram for each section, and then we'll solve for the force in each part of the rod. So you can now see I've drawn the free body diagram for section A, B, B, C, and C, D. I've drawn this little wavy line down at the bottom just to show that it's a segment cut, but I forgot to do it down here, but either way, that's what that means. As you can see, I've drawn PAB, PBC, and PCD all coming out of their particular rod section. This will be assuming that all of these rods are in tension. So if we find that we get a negative answer here, here, or here, that just means that we should have drawn our arrow pointing up, and that would indicate that our section right there would be in compression. So now what I'll do that I have the three free body diagrams is I'll write the sum of the forces in the y direction for section cut AB, BC, and CD. And let me do that now. So I've now written the sum of the forces in the y for all three section cuts. If we look at the section cut AB, you would get that the sum of the forces in the y would be equal to zero, would be 15 kips up minus PAB down. This tells us that we get a positive answer for PAB of 15 kips, which means that it's in tension. When we look at the section cut for BC, we've got 15 kips going up, four kips going down, four kips going down, and PBC going down. So we've got 15 minus eight minus PBC. This tells us that PBC is seven kips, and because we get a positive answer, we know that it's a tension, T. When we look at this section cut over here, section CD, we'll see that the sum of the forces in the Y is gonna be 15 up, minus the two fours going down, minus these two eight kip forces going down here, and minus PCD. So you'll see we've got all of that in our equation right here, and we actually will get a negative answer for PCD, which means that it is in compression. So that's why I put a little C right there, and if we want to, we can put a negative, but to me, I don't really care when I look at the answers to this. As long as you've got this circle here, I know whether your answer means tension or compression. So now that we know the force in each section of the rod, we can answer part A, which is to determine the normal stress in each of the section cuts. So let me write out the formulas for that and show you how I would proceed. Now we'll look at part A, which is to solve for the stress. We know that the equation for stress is the normal force in each section of the rod, P, divided by the area of each cross section. So we know the diameter of every cross section. So given what we just did here and using our equation for stress, we'll be able to solve for the stress in each section. And I'll write out those equations right now. So I've now taken the P of each section, cut PAB, PBC, and PCD, and divided by that cross-sectional area for each section. So what we'll find we get is that for sigma AB, we get 19.09 KSI. And the reason we get KSI units out, that's kilopounds per square inch. That's because we have kips over square inch, or kilopounds per square inch. So that's why we're getting KSI out. So we've got sigma AB. Sigma BC would be 2.228 KSI. And sigma CD, because it's in compression, is going to give us a negative stress, which is negative 2.865 KSI. Now that we've got all this for part A, 
we can go up here and figure out the total change in length of the whole system. So for part B, to solve for the total change in length of the system, A, B, C, D, we know that that's going to be the change in length of each component added together. The change in length of AB plus the change in length of BC plus the change in length of CD. We know from material properties that the change in length is FL over EA, FLE. We can rewrite this equation because we have F over A, we can change this equation here to be stress times L over E. Now why might we do that? The reason that this would be advantageous here is because we already just went through this problem and solved for the stress in each section of the uh, bars. So as a result, what we can do is we can take the values from before and now just multiply by L over E for each particular section. So what I'll do is I'll set this up for each of the bars and we'll see what we get in a second. So you can see for the change in length of A, B, B, C, and C, D, I've taken the stress we calculated in part A and I multiply that by the length of each section which we're given in feet. So I've converted each of the lengths to inches by multiplying the feet that we are provided in the picture over on the left times 12 inches per foot. And I divide by the Young's modulus in KSI for each of the given sections of rod, A, B, B, C, and C, D. One thing you might be wondering is why am I dividing by KSI down here? We were given everything in PSI. Well, because our stress is in KSI, we need to have uh, similar units on the bottom. So the way that I did this, I didn't do it for every single one, but I showed you down here that I took 10 times 10 to the 6th PSI for section BCD, and I'm multiplying that by 1 KSI divided by 10 times 10 to the 3rd PSIs. So what this does is this is actually going to get us the 10 times 10 to the 3rd KSI, and this actually should be 1 times 10 to the 3rd PSI. So after we plug everything in right there, what we'll find is we get our answers for each one of these is 0 0.01527 inches for change in length of AB. That's going to be positive. It's stretching because our tension in that section is pulling the rod out. Change in length of BC is also going to be a positive value. It's going to be 0 0.004 inches. And for change in length of CD, because it's got a negative stress, we know that's going to be shrinking, which will imply that we get a negative answer here, which is negative 0.00343 inches. Now what we do is we plug these three values into the equation we have here, and we'll get that the total change in length of ABCD is equal to dun, 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 positive 0.015 8.42 inches. Now, the last question is to determine the Poisson's ratio for the aluminum used in section BCD. We're told that the magnitude of the change in diameter of section CD is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 4 inches. So we know that change in diameter is going to involve Poisson's ratio, which we're given for uh, neither of them, which actually that's our question here. So we're doing this question a little bit backwards than we might normally see in the class, is not to solve for change in diameter, because we're given that, but actually here we're asked to solve for the Poisson's ratio. So let me set up the equation for that and show you how to proceed. So for Poisson's ratio in part C, we know that it is equal to the negative transverse strain over the axial strain. We know the transverse strain is change in diameter over initial diameter, whereas axial strain is the change in length over the initial length. We can see that all of this is going to be unitless, so we just have to make sure that all our units are going to match, which we'll use inches. And we can plug in everything we know for section CD, which is the part that we're trying to determine uh, Poisson's ratio for. And CD is a part of BC, and because this is all aluminum, it's the same thing. So I plug in 1.6 times 10 to the negative 4 inches, which is the change in diameter for CD that we're given. I divide that by 2 inches, which is the diameter initial that we're given in the problem statement. I divide all of that by the axial strain, which is the change in length of section CD, which we determined was 0 0.00343, so this is negative down here, divided by the initial length, which was 1 foot, but in inches is 12 inches. So when we do all that, what we get down here is we're actually going to get a positive value for Poisson's ratio, right, because we've got the whole thing was negative, and I guess that's why I wrote this in red, so we can draw this negative is kind of the negative of the whole problem, We've got a negative on the bottom, so those negatives cancel out. And we get the Poisson's ratio for segment CD, which is really BCD, 
is going to be equal to 0 0.279. And there are no units, so we're good to go. And that is how you approach this stepped rod problem, which essentially asks you to take the section cuts, which we do up here. We figure out we want to look up. We draw the free bedded diagram for each section cut. We do a sum of the forces to find the normal force in each section. And then once we knew those forces, we were able to find the stress. Using the stress and from part A, we're able to solve for the change in length in each segment, which we did right here. And in the last section, we just had to solve for Poisson's ratio. So we used our equation right here, plugged and chugged all the numbers that we had been given and solved for in the previous steps. And we get our final answer right there. So there you go. Let's take a look at this truss problem, which is problem number four from the old exam problems. We're told that we have a Howe roof truss, there's a pin connection at A, and a roller connection at G. We're told that all the forces are applied as shown, we've got the geometries of the bridge, and we're asked two questions. To identify all zero force members, if any, by inspection, and to find the forces in CD, CK, LK, BC, and BL. The number one step that I like to do in every truss problem is take a highlighter and highlight the members that we need to solve for. So we need to solve for CD, CK, and LK. So I'll highlight those here. CD, CK, and LK. And we're also asked to solve for BC and BL, which are BC right here, and BL right there. So now we can see that all of the trusses uh, members that we're looking to solve for are over here on this leftmost side. This is gonna tell us how to solve the problem. And what we should try and do is take a moment of sections cut through these three members right here, because it's always very effective to try and cut through three things when you don't know what they are. So we'll draw a dotted red line, and we'll try and figure out whether we want to look to the left of this cut or whether we want to look to the right of the cut. If we look to the left, what we would see is the pin reaction forces AX and AY, and we'd see this 1,000 pound force. If we kept the cut and looked to the right, we would see 800 pounds, 600 pounds, 800 pounds, and a roller force. So we would see one, two, three, four things. So because we're not given the reaction forces in this problem, which sometimes on an exam you are, I'm going to decide to look left because there are only three things over there, and we have only one X force. As a result, I think it'll be pretty easy to look to the left and solve everything from there. So I'm going to draw my arrows over to this way and I'm going to look left. Now normally I would have to draw a free body diagram for this whole system here to figure things out, but just to make our lives a little bit easier and to save my hand from all this writing, I'm gonna take out a green marker here and draw the external reaction forces that we have acting on our truss, which is GY, AY, and AX. So these are the reaction forces that we have, and what I'm going to do is look at the whole truss to try and solve for AX and AY so that I can include that in my section cut as I move forward. So the first step now, pretty much, is to figure out how I'm gonna solve for AX and AY. If we look, there's only one X force here, which is AX, and one X force on the truss, which is 800 pounds. So fairly easily, you can see that if I write some of the forces in the X, I'll find that AX is equal to 800 pounds. So let me do that now. So after I write the sum of the forces in the x equation, I do see that ax is in fact 800 pounds, and I get a negative because I drew ax to the right. It really should have been to the left. Now I have to figure out how to get ay. Well, the best way to get ay is probably to do a sum of the moments about point g. I can't do some of the forces in the y for the whole truss because I don't know ay and I don't know gy, so I'd be out of luck. So the only place I can go is to do a sum of the moments about point g, and then I'll have one unknown, which will be AY. So let me set that equation up now. So what you can see right now is that I've got AY times 36, which is this distance right here between A and G. That's going to cause things to rotate clockwise, so I've made that negative. I've got this 1,000 pound force using line of action is 30 away, and that's going to cause things to rotate counterclockwise. I've got the 800 pound force. That's a distance of nine feet away using line of action, and that would cause things to rotate clockwise. 
I've got this 600 pound force times 18, which is counterclockwise, so that's positive. And then I've got this 800 force times 12 feet, which is also counterclockwise and positive. All of this leads me to the final answer that AY is equal to 1,200 pounds. So I'll just kind of lightly circle that answer because we probably will need that later. And um, now that we have AX and AY, I can actually use the section cut here that I've drawn in the dotted red line. So my next step will be to draw a free body diagram of this section cut. And I'll set that up kind of right over here right now. So what you can see is I've now drawn my free body diagram of the section cut over here. I just want to make sure that I have all the dimensions that are important. So I'll draw the height of nine feet over here and I'll also include my XY axes. What we can see we're going to need is we're going to need the geometry and the angles of inclination of CD and CK. So what I did was I kind of brought those over to here and drew out CD and CK so that I could kind of see these as a little bit more exploded of a view to figure out what's going on. So let's go over to our truss. If we look and I kind of put a dotted line right here, you could see that from CD, BC, and here, like we have got three fairly similar triangles right here. So if we know that this height, this height, and this height are all building towards nine feet, and that the bases are all six feet, we can see that this is gonna be six and three, 12 and six, uh, 18 and nine. So this tells us that the height of CD is three feet. And we know already from the picture that the width is six feet. So I just used a squared plus b squared equals c squared to find that this was 6.7 feet so that I could use similar triangles and ratios to solve. If you wanted to, you could also say that this is 26.56 degrees of theta, and that would be fine as well. For CK, what we can see is that um, this cuts off right there. So if this height here is 3 feet, then this height here is going to be 6 feet, and we know that the width is also 6 feet. So we get a little bit lucky with CK, and we know that the height is six feet, this is six feet, so I don't use similar triangles here. I realize this is a 45 degree angle, and I'm gonna use that as we move forward. So I won't draw that on the free body diagram, I'm gonna include that right there, that way it uh, should be set up pretty good. And um, now what I'll do is try and figure out how to solve for all the forces. Now before we do that, question A did ask us to find all the zero force members by inspection. So we should real quick see if there are any zero force members before I move forward with this analysis to make sure that you know I'm not solving for something that ends up being zero. So zero force members, uh, we wanna look for a T. So anywhere where we see something that looks like this, anywhere we see something that looks like this, or anywhere we see a joint that looks like this. So it's one of those three things. So we can see right here, at joint H, we've got a T. It looks just like this. So as a result, member FH is gonna be a zero force member. Now what's important about zero force members is that if you identify this member as a zero force member, you have to remove it from the truss altogether and analyze the truss as if this member didn't exist at all. So if this member didn't exist, you would see now that JF would intersect EF and FJ in this methodology right here. So this, would be a zero force member as well. And then if that was a zero force member, another domino falls, which is EJ, because then this member will be linked with the bottom of the truss is in method one, which is the T. Therefore, EJ is a zero force member. I can't rule anything out at E. K's got a lot of stuff going on. We've got external loads at B and D and A. So if I look at C, doesn't look like any of those three things, so we're good. If I look down here, yeah, none of those three conditions either. So really the only other spot I can find any of these three conditions is going to be BM. So this is a zero force member. So the three zero force members we get using the scanning of this uh, three modes is BM, EJ, FJ, and FH. So once we got that, we're good to go. That's actually none of the members that we have in question, but the fact that BM is a zero force member, as you'll see in the next page of uh, solutions, because this is a long problem, this will actually be quite relevant because it's gonna help us solve for member BC and BL a lot faster. So anyway, after we've done the zero force member stuff, we'll come back down here to our free body diagram 
and see that we need to solve for CD, CK, and LK. Now the best thing to do in a method of sections cut is to either take the moments about point K or about point C. The reason being that if we take the moments about point K, LK and CK both pass through that point, so they won't matter. If we take the moments about point C here, then CD and CK both pass through that point, so they won't have a moment through that point either. So what I did when I solved this problem was I first took the sum of the moments about point C. So by taking the sum of the moments about this point C right here, I'm getting rid of CD and CK, and I'm solving very quickly for LK. The reason I'm doing this is because LK has only an X component, so it's going to be very easy to plug this into my equation, whereas if I started with some of the moments about K, I'd have to factor in all of the X and Y components of CD, and that just seems like a little bit more work. So let me write out the equation for some of the moments about point C, which is this point right here, and you'll see what I set up. So I've now set up the sum of the moments about point C. You can see that I've got AX is multiplied by this distance of 6 using line of action, so that's clockwise. I've got minus AY times this distance here of 12, that's also going to be clockwise. And I've got 1,000 pounds at a distance of 6 feet away, that's going to be counterclockwise. And I've got LK multiplied by 6 feet as well, which is also going to be counterclockwise. When I plug and chuck all of these things right here, I find that LK is going to be equal to 2,200 pounds. And because we get a positive answer here, that indicates that this member is in tension. And I will now box my answer. Woohoo! Cha-ching! So there we go. Now the next step that I would do in this question is I would sum the moments about point K. Because if I do that, then I can go and get point CD really fast. So let me set up that equation. So here I've set up the equation now. We've got AY times 18. That's going to be clockwise, so that's negative. We've got 1,000 times 12. Also going to be positive here because it's counterclockwise. And then we've got the two components of CD. So if you look at CD, CD is going to have an X component. And it's going to have a good old-fashioned Y component. And I probably should have drawn that arrow a little bit longer. <laughs> Whoops. But I'll do that right now so you can see. So what we have is 6 over 6.7 6, uh, 6 over 6 CD, which is its X component based off of this similar triangle here. So we're taking the kind of red component of CD right here, and we're multiplying that by 6 because it's 6 feet right here from there to here, and that's going to be clockwise. We'll also have the Y component, 3 over 6.7, and that would really be coming from here, so that would be going clockwise around point K. So this is our Y component of CD. So that's all that we need for this equation right here. We don't include CK or LK because those pass through point K. So after I plug and chug all of this math here, I'll find that CD is equal to negative 1,192.5 pounds. And because I've gotten a negative answer here, that will indicate that my beam of this truss, CD, is in compression. Now that I've done two sum of the moment equations, the next step to do is just to solve for CK. As you can see, CK has a Y component of force. So rather than do another sum of the moments, which it's not really clear where I would do that about, maybe point D, but that would just be really messy. I'll do a sum of the forces in the Y, and I'll set that up right over here, and uh, we'll solve for member CK. So I've now set up the sum of the forces in the Y. So you can see that we've got AY going up, which is right here. We've got the 1,000 pounds going down right here. We've got the Y component of CD, which I drew in blue. So I'll put that here. And then we've got the Y component of CK, which it doesn't really matter, honestly, because we have an angle of 45 degrees. Both the X and Y component are going to be the same. But we have CK times the sine of 45, which I'll say is the purple component of CK. We can plug and chug all these numbers here because we already know CD from before. And one thing to kind of point out is we keep our free body diagram the same here. Even though we found out that CD was in compression, we don't just flip the arrow and change everything. We keep our free body diagram the same, and as a result, you see that in the Y direction, I have CD is going up. Now, we know that technically CD is going to be going down, but this gets resolved when I plug in the negative value for CD here. So that will keep everything straight, and we'll get our answer to work out. And what we find here is that CK is equal to negative 472 0.4 pounds, 
And because we've got a negative answer, that means that our member of that piece of truss is in compression. Bum, ba, da, da. Bum, bum, bum. So there we go. Now we gotta figure out what's the next step. So we've already just solved for CD, CK, and LK. The last two that we need to solve for are BC and BL. Now if we look at our truss, we can see that BC and BL are kind of very close to this point A over here. Now what I could theoretically do is I could make another section cut here and look to the left, but the reason why that doesn't seem very appealing to me is that BC and BL both have components. So if I do any sum of the moments to solve for stuff, I'm going to have to include all these different components and it's just going to be, in my opinion, fairly messy. One thing that helps us is the fact that we identified that BM was a zero force member. If this member is not here, then one thing we can see is that when we solve for member AB, if this member goes away, then at this joint B, we'd have only BC and BL as unknowns. So what that means I'm going to do is I'm going to do some of the or, or method of joints right here, point A, and I'm going to solve for member AB. Once I solve for member AB, I'm going to jump to member, uh, or sorry, point B, and because we have two unknowns here, I'm going to again do method of joints and solve for BC and BL. So let me get another piece of paper because uh, I've run out of space, and we'll solve for that stuff right there, and I'll show you how it's done. So now I've got my new sheet of paper here. And just to reiterate, my plan is going to be, because BM is a zero force member, I'm going to do method of joints at A. I'm going to solve for AB. And once I have AB, I'm then going to do method of joints at section uh, point B and get BC and BL. So what I have to do then is draw a free better diagram of point A, and I'll do that right now. So here's my free better diagram. I'll include an XY axis just to be consistent. And what we can see is that AB is just like what we did before with CD. It's got a height of 3, it's got a width of 6. So we know that hypotenuse is 6.7. I use that for similar triangles. And uh, what we can see is because I have a Y, I can do some of the forces in the Y, because AB is the only other force with a Y component. So by doing some of the forces in the Y and setting that equal to 0, I can very quickly see that I've got a Y, which from before was 1,200 pounds, plus... 3 over 6.7 AB, which is the Y component of AB right here. Doing this, I get that AB is equal to negative 2,680 pounds. And because I've got a negative answer here, that means that I've got a beam that's in compression. But as you'll see, I won't change anything with free body diagrams. I'll just keep this negative and plug it into my next set. So this was successful. I've solved for AB now, which is my first step. My second step was to do method of joints at section B and solve for BC and BL. So let me draw the free body diagram of joint B and show you how that works out. Now I've got the free body diagram of point B. What you can see is I've got the 1,000 pound force coming down on the truss. I've got member AB with its force here. I'm assuming it's in tension, even though I know it's in compression, but that'll work out. I've got BC and I've got BL here, and the geometry of all of these is the same. It's a 3, 6 by 6.7 triangle. So the two unknowns I have right now are BC and BL. So I need to write two equations to solve for those two unknowns, and those two equations are going to be the sum of the forces in the X and the sum of the forces in the Y. So let me set up the sum of the forces in the X equation and show you what you would do after you did that. So I've got my sum of the forces in the X which is 6 over 6.7 of AB, BC, and BL. AB is negative because it goes to the left, I've said, and BC and BL, I'm assuming, are going to the right, so I've got those as positive. Now, I've got all these like kind of numbers here, but what I should realize is because 6 over 6.7 is multiplied by everything, I can actually factor that out and get rid of it from my equation. So I get BC plus BL minus AB equals 0. But if I take BC and BL, I can move AB to the other side, which would become positive, but AB is actually negative, so I would cancel out a little bit. But what I would see if I solve for one in terms of the other is that I would get that BC is equal to negative 2,680 pounds minus BL. Now using this, I just need to now write a sum of the forces in the Y equation below this, and I can plug this in and solve for BC. 
So I've now written the sum of the forces in the y equation. I've got negative 3 over 6.7 AB minus 1,000 plus 3 over 6.7 BC minus 3 over 6.7 BL. Something that I did just to make this a little bit easier was I divided every term by 3 over 6.7. And when I did this, given the fact that I knew AB, the equation that I more or less got was the following. So here's the equation I got. I divided everything by 3 over 6.7 to cancel that out. So when I did that, I got that 1,000 became this value right here. I brought that to the other side. I brought AB to the other side and plugged its value in. And then I plugged in this thing right here for BC. So you can see I get negative 2680 minus BL minus BL equals all this stuff here. So this gives me that BL is equal to negative 1116.8 pounds because we get a negative answer that implies it's in compression. And then I plug that value back into right here. And then I find out that BC is equal to 1,563 pounds. And that is also going to be in compression as well because we also get a negative answer for that. So there you go. That's pretty much how you did this trust problem. It was fairly complicated. If we look back at what we did in the very beginning, you can see that we did have a lot of work to do because we had to set up the equations to solve for AX and AY. Typically on an exam, you'd be given these values here, but it is good practice to understand that you can look at the free body diagram of the whole trust to solve for that. Then after that, we pretty much just did a method of sections, did some moment equations about the point where members intersect, both K and C, then did some of the forces in the Y direction, and then pretty much using our knowledge of zero force members, figured out a pretty efficient strategy to solve using method of joints for the last two members that we needed to solve for. Well, it's already that time again. Exam number two. After it was so successful last time in the review session where I came to Testudo and donated my special red Expo marker, I thought I'd come back and donate another special present to ensure your success on exam number two. This time, I thought instead of bringing a red Expo marker, I'd bring Testudo something a little bit more tasty from where I'm from. And that, of course, is a good old-fashioned Wawa Billy Pretzel. Please, Testudo, help my Aeneas 102 students crush their second exam and be amazing engineers in the future. Good luck, everyone. I'm sure you're going to do great. <laughs>